Welcome to Type Tune Tint. I'm Tom Kranz. I don't want to grow up. I'm a Toys R Us kid. A generation of shoppers remember Toys R Us as the ultimate toy store. Today's guests spent almost 30 years working for Toys R Us in various capacities. Sal Panici answered an ad in the Newark Star-Ledger for what was simply described as a job in retail. He soon learned all about retail, toys, and the people who buy toys, and he wrote about it in a short book called In the Toy Box. And I'm joined right now by Sal Panici from his uh, palatial estate in North Jersey. Uh, nice to meet you in person, Sal. I just read your little book here, and we're going to learn all about you and your life uh, as a toy mogul. Uh, tell me, where in New Jersey are you right now? Tell us what town you're in. I am in Woodland Park, which is kind of west of Patterson. And it used to be called the Old West Patterson. And you're a Jersey guy through and through, right? Born and raised? Absolutely. There's no place like the Jersey Shore. That is true. And I'm a Philadelphia transplant. So it it was a bit of a, it was a sell job to get me to Lake New Jersey, but I would say the shore is probably its main, uh, the, the thing I would miss the most, most likely. I wouldn't miss yep. the taxes. I wouldn't miss the car insurance, but I would miss the shore for sure. So you, um, I'm going to, we're, we're talking here today about your book in the toy box. I have it here. It's a very short book. <laughs> It uh, only took me about an hour to read. It's like 38 pages. It looks to me like you had a lot to say. And then by the time you had it printed, it was not maybe as long as you thought it was. But I uh, gives you a little <laughs> bit of an insight into the toy business. And I was first attracted to doing this interview because I also worked in the toy business in my youth from about age 17 to age 21 or so, maybe 22. Um, I worked at an independent toy store in Philadelphia, the all new discount toy center. And I, a lot of the things you talked about uh, rang true with me in terms of the customers, the toys, the competition, how crazy people get when they see a toy that they absolutely have to have and they'll do anything to get it. Right. And we'll talk more about that. Tell us a little bit about your background. So you're from New Jersey where, you know, where'd you go to school? What'd you do? And how did you end up working for Toys R Us? Um, I, went to Seton Hall University. I went to Don Bosco Tech, which was a very nice high school. Uh, and then I ended up going to Seton Hall University because my guidance counselor and best friend in Don Bosco High School filled out an application for me because I was not college minded whatsoever. Uh, and he ended up getting me basically for college back then. Um, total i ended up paying two thousand dollars for four years which is unbelievable wow. that was at seton hall that was at seton hall yeah and what year was that oh gosh it was 19 i graduated in 72 so it was 1968 okay. yeah. wow that's a bargain well i went to temple as an in-state uh, resident and my dad got a little scholarship from uh his work so i ended up going to temple for four years for i mean maybe two thousand dollars those were the days man <laughs> yeah yeah it was unbelievable okay so you went there and then what did you what did you first start working as you didn't start life in the toy business correct no i well at right after college i ended up going into the national guard it was either national guard or being drafted um we were speaking earlier about your you know, CBS career. I always wanted to work in television to some capacity. In fact, uh, my neighbor around the corner, who was not a communication major, ended up working at NBC. I have no idea what capacity, but <laughs> that's where he ended up working. Um, so I, when I got back from National Guard basic training, uh, the person at the connection that I theoretically had at CBS uh, was transferred to Chicago. So my vision kind of was was dashed at that point. Uh, I worked for Prudential Insurance in Newark, New Jersey. Um, they did training films, so I was able to be a cameraman or a sound person or whatever um, until their, their production season was done. And then after that, I worked in two couple companies for industrial advertising. Um, and every, every year, two years, I was being laid off. So after... <laughs> Five years, six years of that, uh, a friend. That's when a friend of mine said, "Well, why don't you try retail? They never lay anybody off." So I. I <laughs> well, that was then. This is now, right? 
then and now. Um, I mm -hmm. saw an ad in the Newark Star Ledger, which, if you could believe, nobody to, even remembers what that paper was. I know. I, I that's how I got my last job, by the way. Yeah. I looked oh, in really? the Sunday ads and I, I applied. And, go ahead. I'm sorry. Okay. Yeah. So you saw this ad for retail. Yeah. I mean, uh, they're looking for somebody who's a self starter, creative, blah, 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 blah. And I said, well, that's me. Why not? I'll, I'll, I'll apply. And two weeks later, I got a call from this person saying, we would like you to come and you know talk to us. And that's when I did. It, it was kind of a blind ad. And that's when I found out it was really Toys R Us. Um, and then he gave me a day to think about it. So uh, do I want it? Do I want not not want it? Um, my unemployment at that point was about to run out. So I guess I wanted it. So I, I went for the interview and I got into their store training program, their management store management training program. Right. And so I think I remember reading that you weren't particularly like dying for this job, right? No, no. Uh, <laughs> even then, even then I knew what working with the public was like. It was yeah. like, oh, yeah, since I was part of the public anyway, and I know what I was like when something goes wrong or I, I don't agree with somebody you know, in retail telling me to do something or not giving me what I supposedly was promised. So it was it was an experience. You train like a month in different different stores in the area, uh, because in the northern Jersey area, that you can go ten miles and the people's temperaments and whatever are totally different. Uh, mm -hmm. You you can go over the river, New York. It's like the stores in Brooklyn, how they treated their customers so drastically different than than the courtesy that we would al allow, you know, a, a client in New Jersey. Okay, so, so wait, so wait. So the reason you trained in different places was because the customers were different, and I guess the markets were different. Correct. The markets were different. People's needs, you know, customers' needs were different. How different can they be? I mean, I, I don't. I guess I. You had a couple good anecdotes in the book about people in Brooklyn, uh, and also about employees at the Brooklyn store. But how? I mean, give me just how can they be that much different? Yeah. Uh, well, different areas that. You know, are not highly populated. So, you know, there's not that as, as many children in certain markets. So yeah. the need for boys toys or girls toys or, 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 you know, games and, and puzzles and stuff like that. I mean, that it, it differs from store to store. And at that time we actually, before there was a babies or us, we sold a lot of infant care items, mm -hmm. you know, in the store. So those needs changed and, um, Store management definitely changed. You could have we had good store managers and not so good store managers. So you kind of saw the style and what kind of worked and what really didn't work. All right, tell it, me what uh, what made Brooklyn so special. <laughs> New Yorkers are New Yorkers. They'll always be in New York, but there's such a difference between city New Yorkers and borough New Yorkers. And and the more a customer demanded something, the more management said no. <laughs> it was better that you go into the store with a smile on your face and say, I'm sorry, you know, kind of apologetic, but this was bought incorrectly or this was broken when I got it. And yeah. and, and we've got a lot of Kmart stuff back to Toys R Us if they sold this. And they'd come in with this, the, the Kmart sticker on it. And, you know, people. But Toys R Us gave the money, gave you gave refunds yeah, anyway. Yeah, that, was, that was one of their the issues that really I think Toys R Us should not have had. I mean. We took everything and anything back, regardless of the condition and, and the, the, all that nonsense. But if somebody came in, you know, belligerent, the store gave it back twice as much. And it's, you know, as far as the belligerency goes. So going so, into the Brooklyn store with attitude was not a good idea, basically. Not a good idea at all. <laughs> <laughs> That's so not funny. In the store that I worked at, um, we worked, it was a neighborhood store in uh, a neighborhood of Philadelphia called Alney, it was on a shopping district. Again, I'm, I, this was the late 70s. So, I mean, back in those days, of course, there was no internet, there was no digital anything, there was no right. electronic anything. Right. You know, things that were big well, at the we time. Started, were, we mm -hmm. started with uh, the Commodore computer. Oh, sure. We, we, when I started in the, in the training programs in the store, we had tons of these big, huge you know, monitors, you know, Commodore monitors and, and, and computers. And it's like, where we're going to be, nobody knew what, how to troubleshoot them or how to advise people on what to buy and what, what their conditions were and all that stuff. Hmm. But we, you know, management insisted that everybody's getting into computers today. So we have to sell them. So yeah. we did that. Yeah. 
Yeah, that was uh, prescient at that time. And look where we are now. So I guess, would you say that between then and now, we're talking, what, 40 years later, is that really the biggest change in toys, the electronization and the digitization of everything? I mean, kids are staring at lit screens now and maybe not playing with Tonka trucks as much, right? Right. Absolutely. Absolutely. And everything has an electronic component to it. You know, you, the, the, Thomas the Tank, you know, have, you know it's, it's been electrified. You know, it used to be a little train on a track that you moved physically. Now you can buy like, the, the, you know, a train set that is electric. It's, yeah. and, and, you know, nothing, nothing is stable anymore. It's every, everything has to move uh, or have a level or game level and all that other stuff. Yeah. Amazing how that, how that's changed. Um, so <clears throat> one of the parts of, of your book here that I enjoyed most was reading about the Cabbage Patch Kids craze. So for those of you who are too young, Cabbage Patch Kids was a line of dolls and I guess they each had their own personality. They each had their own name. There were babies. They had, there were... They had the birth certificate. That's that was right. The they had the birth certificate. Yeah. This was a huge craze. I mean, this was, people went nuts for Cabbage Patch Kids. And you talk a little bit about that. In my day, which was, and, and I worked in the business a little before you, we had a doll called Baby Alive. And Baby Alive was popular because you would feed Baby Alive and then Baby Alive would poop. So the whole thing was you had to buy Baby Alive and then you had to buy diapers. And yep. man, I remember our distributors only gave us like a case at a time. So that's six. And then for a while, we only kept them behind the counter. And if somebody came up and said, do you have Baby Alive? We'd pull one out and say, yes, we have it right here. What else would you like to buy? So, you know, it was like, t tell us about the Cabbage Patch Kids. The summer before the actual Christmas craze started is when they actually started coming to the store. And in the, working in this customer service area, you know, pe people would bring it back for some reason. Uh, and everybody in the store said, this is, this is an ugly doll. Who, who the hell would want to buy one of these? Oh, so in the beginning, nobody really got the whole thing, right? No, no. And then I don't, again, I don't know what they're, remember what their advertising was. But um, as soon as October hit, and I guess they started their Christmas buy in September, it's like all hell broke loose. Uh, with the first big ship, and I remember I was in the Paramus store on Route 4, the first big shipment that we had gotten, the instructions were, and then we had a seasonal area. The, put put the, the entire gondola in the seasonal area should be cat, cabbage patch dolls. We put them out, opened the doors, and within a half an hour, they're all gone. That's amazing. It's amazing. It truly. And then <laughs> the one day I was, I was in the customer service area. It was 10 o'clock in the morning. The store opened at 9. Um and there, there were kind of stragglers of dolls on the shelf yet that day. And all of a sudden, oh, this pack of women came because had, they were looking for a name because they, they had matched the name to their child and all this mm -hmm. other nonsense, too. And this one guy couldn't get like to the shelf and he actually dove onto the center of the gondola, picked up his doll, whatever doll was there, and walked out to the, the cashiers to pay for it. Wow. But he dove over all these women. It was like amazing. So these dolls had names, and a big thing was getting a doll that matched the name of your kid. Correct. And that's wow. why year, a couple of years later, they actually came out with the theme, well, you could send the birth certificate in to wherever and change the name to you know, your child's name or, or whatever. So you can All actually right. change the name. Tell the a little story about the lady with the twins. I was in the Totowa store. I was in, finishing my um, management training. And it was probably after Thanksgiving, so maybe the beginning of December. This lady huffing and pretty, pretty lady. She was huffing and puffing. Uh, she asked to speak to a manager, and at that point, no manager in the store wants to talk to anybody. <laughs> so <laughs> somehow it got to call Sal, face Sal to the service area. So Sal goes to the service area, and um, <laughs> she looks at me and she says. I know this is going to sound strange, but I've, I've gone all over the northern New Jersey area and I'm about to have twins and I would love to have, I'm going to have a boy and a girl and I would love to have a Cabbage Patch doll for each. And she said, is there any way that the store can help me? And I said, well, I'm not a manager. I'm only an assistant manager in training here. 
So yeah, I would love to help you, but put your name on. Yep. Yeah. And then it was, I think we had index cards for the cabbage patch list. Mm -hmm. I fill out the, the, the index card and I, I'll place it as far forward in the list as, you know, of course I whispered this to her as I could. So eventually she, she did, because you know, I, I actually saw her come into that. There were, they weren't laid out on the floor that they, they had, the store had to lay them out in the, in the stock room. So mm -hmm. people actually had to go to the stock room to, to pick up their doll. Um, so I actually saw her walking down this, the, uh, the first aisle of the store one day and I didn't think anything of it. And, I think it was Christmas Eve or a day or a couple of days before Christmas Eve. The, the store, oil management is in the store. I was paged to the service area and I, I probably should have pulled it down. I still have it up in my attic. Um, this man comes in with a ceramic Christmas tree that has the little lights on it. Um, and he said, hi, I'm Mr. So-and-so. You helped my wife uh, get two Cabbage Patch dolls. And she she. She insisted that I bring you this little gift that I said, well, I, I it was in the bag. So I, I said, I'm really not allowed to accept gifts. And he said, well, I insist. So I put it in the management you know, room and locked it up and I took it home and opened the bag and it was that ceramic Christmas tree. Wow. So that woman, that family probably still remembers you from getting those dolls for her. I'm, so, I'm very unforgettable. So that, of course, <laughs> of course. All right, so we're going to get back to more uh, stories about people and how crazy they can be about toys. But first, I'm going to do some shameless self-promotion here for my new book, Lights and Sirens. Uh, it'll be coming out shortly. And as soon as I'm finished promoting that book, we will be right back with Sal Panici. Everybody, don't go away. We are back with Sal Panici, a veteran of the toy wars of the 70s and 80s. And I say that because uh, I worked at a toy store myself. And at the time, our big competition was Kitty City. So Kitty yeah. City was, uh, they were huge. And, you know, yeah. we would get so many people who would come into our store and say, you know, I see you have this for $9.99. Kitty City has it for $7.99. And, you know, big stores like that, they can do loss leaders. It's like when you go to the supermarket and they sell Progresso soups for, you know, a couple bucks a can. They they lose money on that to bring people in. We would have to say, well, you know, I can't, I, I really can't beat that price. You're going to have to go to Kitty City. So uh, they were like our big competition, but they were so big. It was like, we knew we had a neighborhood clientele, so we didn't worry that much about that. Um, but <clears throat> your book talks about the lengths that some people will go through to get a specific toy. Cabbage Patch Dolls were one. Um, I gave you my story about Baby Alive. I mean, people got really, really pissed if you didn't have them. Um, wh what happens to people when they, I guess it's the thing about keeping your kids happy, right? It, it, it The child is right. I mean, you have to give your kid what, what that kid wants. You know, it's as, as best you can. Look at the state of the world today because of that. <laughs> yeah, right. Well, I have my own story, okay? Because back when my older son was, he was either two or three. We're talking late 80s here. <clears throat> I saw a toy on TV called the Mickey Town Railroad, right? And this was a little wooden train set. It was designed for young kids, big wooden uh, track pieces. And Mickey Mouse had, it was a wind-up train. It went in a circle. And I said, I must have that for Dan. I must have it. Every store around me didn't have it because it was very popular. At the time, I was working at a TV station, and the consumer reporter happened to be doing a story at the Kitty City somewhere in Camden County. She saw one. She got one. She bought it for me. I was elated. Dan opened it on Christmas morning. He played with it for five minutes, and then he never touched it again. Yeah, so That's my story. But I, I recognize I had to have that, you know, and I just don't, I'm, you know, I'm a rational guy. <laughs> I don't know that I would have divved, I would have dived across, you know, a group of people to get it, but you must have dealt with like a lot of customer service kind of stuff, right? Oh, yeah. The, the, the what the, the worst always sticks out. Um, again, in Paramus on Route Four, Paran that that was the busy. It was closed because of the blue laws on in you know in Bergen County. It was closed on Sunday, hmm. but it was still the busiest store on the East Coast, if not the chain at that point in time. Yeah. 
and a lot of people would come from the city, from New York City, to to shop there because it was right on the on Route Four, mm -hmm. so they could take a bus down or the, yeah, basically a bus. Um, but there was this one lady, and again, it was Saturday morning. People go to breakfast and then they come shopping. Well, something that she had for breakfast did not agree with her, and uh -oh. uh, yeah. She she let it go behind the wall, let it go in front in the in you know on the main aisle so we could clean it up. <laughs> then you have to try to find an employee who's willing to go behind that wall and and clean it up before it starts smelling. Guess who the employee had to be? Because my all my employees said no, <laughs> no. What it are you gonna to do? You got to do what you got to do, right? Hey, it was me. Um, and then. She comes out, no apology, no, I'm so sorry. No, yeah, yeah, yeah. she walks out the store. Yeah, yeah she's probably humiliated, you know. <laughs> Let's talk a little bit about your book. So, uh, when did you write this and why did you write this? Uh, I wrote that probably about three years ago. And I wrote it so that I wouldn't forget what happened for the most part. And I am writing the sequel in the plastic toy box right now, which is my experience in that corporate, uh, Toys R Us corporate. Um, and it's just, I had I had nice experiences. I had some not nice experiences, but you know, you should write about what you know. And I didn't really know anything until <laughs> until I was let go at Toys R Us, I guess. And then I, I realized, oh, I know all this stuff. I, I could write a book. Why not? Now, tell me a little about your writing process. Did you just sit down one night and just puke all this out at one time, or did you write it over a period of time, and how did you do that? No, it was a period of time. I have the outline. Um, yeah, like the corporate one, it's um, I'm going through the different phases and and, I'm, and responsibilities that I had at corporate, and just going to write about the the good experiences that I had in each of those. So, it, it, you know, it's a process. It's like anything else. So for In the Toy Box, you wrote it, you did an outline? Or did you, yeah. do, you have like a checklist of things you wanted to talk about and then you just basically wrote about them? Yes, absolutely. And how long did it take total? <laughs> uh, it took about a year. It's now life after Toys R Us. Yes. What are you doing with yourself uh, after Toys R Us in New Jersey? Well, after Toys R Us... Um, two years after Toys R Us because I was on the older side. And at that point, nobody was hiring, you know, oxygenarians at, at, for anything. Um, I ended up working for Macy's and, and being a, a lady was on maternity leave in men's private brands for Northern New Jersey stores. Uh, so temp, it was a temp job. So I took over while she was on maternity leave. Um, and then she decided not to come back. So they offered me the job. So I ended up working for Macy's and men's private brands for eight years. Um, and then after that, I was eight years older. And when they let me go, um, yeah, it was even more difficult. My unemployment was about to run out. And the, a girl that covered men's private brands in South Jersey called me one day and she said, do you know that unemployment will pay to retrain you in something if whatever hmm. you did was no longer in demand? I, I did said, not know that. I did not know that. So <laughs> I went online, I looked it up, and at the very, very bottom was massage therapy. Because most most of the courses were retraining was um, medical something or other, medical mm -hmm. billing, medical uh, phlebotomy, and all that, that type of stuff. And at the very bottom was massage. And I said, I always wanted to try massage therapy. Why not? So they extended my unemployment for four months. My training was six months, and they pay for the training. Wow. And, so, and the rest is this. So now you do massage therapy. Now, now I'm a part-time massage therapist. And you work out of your house. So you pretty much can set your own schedule and yeah, you can pick and choose right. who your clients are and all that good stuff, right? Yeah, I'm pretty flexible. But you're still yeah. working with the public, man. And now you're putting your hands on them. Isn't that like I, a whole different thing? And and stinky public becomes a different <laughs> a different look outlook when, when you're dealing with massage therapy it's really stinky public but sometimes nice. but 
Well, you survived. Uh, you survived retail, and uh, you know now Toys R Us is is mostly a website. And I think you mentioned that they have a presence in at least one Macy's in New Jersey. In a way, it's kind of you know they went the way of so many brick and mortar stores that were these huge stores that don't exist anymore because the whole retail business ended up going online. But you know, I remember as a kid, there was no greater feeling than going through the toy department at Sears, for example. You know, I'm mean, just the wonder of it was that's something that's going to that, that's lost now. Well, Toys R Us knocked out Child World. They knocked out um uh the store that the store that you we were talking about the the chain Kitty City. That, Kitty City. Yeah. Uh, and and actually, actually uh Target and and Walmart they only their clout started to come into effect during Christmas, mm -hmm. just from the volume, the number of stores that they actually had. Yeah. Uh, they didn't really carry a lot of toys during the normal course of the year. They just carried the basics. Yeah. Uh, we did well, but once Charles Lazarus, the owner and founder, left, like they they would bring in CEOs and you know heads of the company that that are, that are brought in for a specific opportunity, and as long as they did what their contract said that they were supposed to do. They, they made all these, you know, bonuses and, and whatever, yeah. but they never looked at the entire business. So everything mm. went to hell. Yeah. They took care of themselves, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. We've heard that story many times. Well, Sal, I really appreciate the time you spent here. I appreciate uh, you allowing me to reminisce with you a little bit about a business that, you know, it didn't become my career, but it became yours. And it was obviously a big part of your life for a long time. And, you know, I'll, you'll always remember that that lady and, and her husband with their twins, and I'm sure they'll always remember you. So that's a good thing, right? You made a difference in some people's lives. It, it is. It's it's a, it's a nice thing when it happens. Yeah, of course. But, and I, I, yeah, I met a lot of celebrities. Um, I'm sure Howard Mandel doesn't remember me, but he he actually hugged me. None of, none of his fist bumping and stuff. He shook hands. He hugged me. Whatever, because we did two projects with him. Uh, Sherry Lewis was my all time favorite. Oh, Sherry Lewis and Lamb Chop, right? The yeah. yeah. I, I mean, as a kid growing up, I loved her, and I was in licensing show, and there was a, a party. I guess that they her manufacturer was putting on, and it was like seven o'clock in the morning, and they made a, us peons that corporate go in in and out every day. So you had to be there by seven for the breakfast and all this stuff. So it was it was it was a job, and I walk in in the door and all of a sudden it's like the, the Red Sea parted, and there was this little person, because she was I don't know, maybe four eleven or something like that, and she and she she looks at me and she said hi and she saw my name oh from Toys R Us hi I'm Sherry Lewis in your name I said my name is Sal and she said Morty come over here I want you to meet Sal from Toys R Us <laughs> it, it was wonderful. She, she was a wonderful, wonderful lady. Uh, that's a great story. So, folks, uh, the book, or should I say the booklet, is In the Toy Box by Sal Panici, my guest today, available on Amazon for a little bit uh, behind the curtain in the toy business and in dealing with people. Sal, I really appreciate you joining me. Good luck to you. Oh, thank you. I appreciate the opportunity. You got it. I want to grow up on Toys R Us. Get they got a million toys at Toys R Us that I can play with. I want to grow up I'm a Toys R Us kid. They got the best for so much less. You'll really flip your lid. From bikes to trains to video games. It's the biggest toy store there is. Gee whiz. I don't want to grow up, because maybe if I did, I couldn't be a Toys R Us kid. Once a Toys R Us kid, always a Toys R Us kid.